and uh, welcome to our session on the Western Balkans and the Eastern Neighbourhood. My name is Natasha Bunch. I'm an assistant professor in political science and European integration with the Centre for European Studies and Comparative Politics at Sciences Po, and it's my pleasure to host the panel this morning. I have with me four wonderful colleagues whom I'll briefly introduce just before they share their opening remarks with us. And we've agreed to keep these introductory remarks quite short in order to engage in a more interactive discussion on the EU's dealings with its candidate countries and its eastern neighbours. And we'll then open up the floor to the audience. I will invite the speakers to share their remarks in the order that they appear on the programme. So first up, we have Dr. Irena Rajinovska Paneva, Vice Dean for Science and International Cooperation at Justicianos Primos Law Faculty at St. Cyril and Methodius University in North Macedonia. Irina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for, for inviting me to speak on the topic and keeping the discourse on enlargement of Western Balkans active. The current state of affairs on the North Macedonian file is not optimistic, is a stalemate, or as some put it in a more vivid manner, it resembles a daily routine of a hamster in a wheel. Another association that comes to mind is a segment of Macedonian folklore related to our traditional dance, but in reverse. And for this purpose, it goes one step forward, three steps backwards. As you all know, uh, 17 years have passed since North Macedonia applied for accession. And from a front runner, it became a laggard. 2020 was supposed to be a year of success for North Macedonia in terms of reaching its Euro-Atlantic goals. <clears throat> in late March 2020, North Macedonia became a full NATO member and uh, EU opened its doors along with Albania by reaching the decision to launch accession talks with both countries. Conversely, it did not include a specific date for the start of accession talks, while at the same time, it included a novel enlargement methodology and was coupled with the Commission's plan for the region. By the end of 2020, Bulgaria vetoed the decision to open talks with North Macedonia, a move which indirectly also affected Albania as part of the tandem. The explanation provided was that North Macedonia failed to deliver on the bilateral agreement and blocked the work of the Joint Committee tasked to sort out the issues of common history. Now, much can be said about the implementation of the agreement, such as cooperation in trade, in education, in transport, and so forth, which is, uh, of course, dependent on the dedication of both countries and their reciprocity, but above all, uh, cannot be exhibited as the real reason behind the veto. The Joint Committee was established under the agreement as multidisciplinary expert commission for historic and educational matters in order to contribute to the objective and scientifically founded interpretations of historic events. So it has a mandate to discuss without a set time frame and has done so in the past years with a limited success due to the extreme Bulgarian positions that tackle the foundations of Macedonian national identity. Despite the signing of the bilateral agreement and the mechanism of dialogue and cooperation provided by it, Bulgaria chose to block the accession. Uh, it has objections, keeps highlighting additional notions, which to outsiders may seem trivial and benign, and its position is increasingly entrenched in spite of mounting pressure to entangle the enlargement process. The past few years have been difficult for the Western Balkan and North Macedonia in particular due to the pandemic, <clears throat> but most substantially because there is a sense that the EU policy towards the region and North Macedonia, uh, since the fiasco of October 2019, the absence of success in 2020, and the most probable no this year yet again, is unprincipled or to put it bluntly unfair especially in correlation to the overall positive assessment on our progress and uh, major concessions related to the PRESPA agreement. The implications of the latter still do and will continue to affect us, notably since a large extent of the population rejects it and sizable segment of the political elites keep questioning it, yet most significantly for the reason that this was considered as a trade-off for EU accession and it was promoted as such and openly backed by the EU itself. If we aim to narrow the EU policy down to its response to counter the pandemic and assist the recovery of the region and North Macedonia in particular, we would find an increase of Euroscepticism, 
lately linked to the perception that the response was not enough and too late to make a difference. In our case, this display is weighted by past complexities of, on our path uh, towards EU, including the enlargement fatigue, but also in line with the apparent reality that this path of ours keeps getting more and more compromised and manifests as endless at this point. On the national front, North Macedonia has made enormous concessions, has shown readiness and capacity to compromise and conduct tough reforms, and continues to work on reaffirming its dedication and preparedness to start accession talks, which was of course praised and supported by the EU. Sadly, recently we have also seen a proliferation of dangerous ideas and some non-papers flying over the Balkans, and I do name them as such since they were maps redrawn on the back of a menu card not so long ago, as you remember, and we all know how potent the idea of maps and nationalism can be in the region. We have also witnessed an increased presence on, of non-European uh, factors such as China and uh, Russia, foremost related to the vaccine supply, and a rise of EU interest for the region with the new president and his latest executive order. Nonetheless, EU remains as the largest donor and leading supporter of democratic and economic reform and a lately foremost contributor of assistance to the region's recovery. So to sum up, the Bulgarian demands cannot be justified by the membership criteria and go beyond the standard of good neighbor relations. Reaching a mutual ground will not be easy or pleasant endeavor and requires compromise on both sides. sides. Uh, let's not forget that uh, currently uh, the state is occupied by North Macedonia and Bulgaria, and later on, if this challenge is not met adequately, there can be other examples with other countries bringing in and fighting for their own national interests on that same stage. And finally, the vital argument that should not be overlooked is that this is only the beginning, since we are not at the end of the negotiation pro process, but at its inception. I will stop here and I hope that during the discussion I will be able to address some issues in more depth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irena, for this certainly uh, sobering summary of the Macedonian situation. Um, I, uh, I like the image of a, of a hamster wheel of uh, running ever on, but without really um, coming forward. We will turn next to um, Yuri Yakimenko from uh, Verazunkov Center and he's the president there and will share a view from Ukraine. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, thank you, Natasha, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you for the possibility to present uh, Ukrainian view from the eastern flank of European neighborhood and to contribute to this discussion with uh, some thoughts about uh, current uh, problems, issues uh, in relation between EU and Eastern Partnership. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, remind that this year Ukraine will celebrate the 30th anniversary of its independence. And more than 20 years, we are living with proclaimed goal of Ukraine accession to the EU. If you recall, historically, the respective state document has been adopted in 1998. But uh, before uh, Ukraine, from the very early years of independence, have selected this uh, geopolitical choice and civilizational choice and started to build and to modernize the institute of statehood uh, in a European way. And uh, further, it was uh, uh, confirmed by the first Ukrainian constitution in 1995. Uh, now, uh, topic of promotion of democracy and rule of law uh, is uh, again uh, obtaining additional topicality in order to uh, geopolitical context and recent uh, proceedings in the, the countries of Eastern Partnership. I keep in mind, first of all, dramatic developments in uh, Belarus, in Belarus, uh, cut political conflicts uh, and contradictions in Moldova and Georgia, uh, armed conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, in Nagorno Karabakh, uh, permanent threat of escalation in the zone of Russian-Ukrainian armed conflict, and so on. Uh, in our view, general processes and trends uh, in our region uh, gave us, us a uh, ground and possibilities for the following uh, conclusions. First of all, in our view, European uh, politics of neighborhood, and first of all, its vector on Eastern partnership, it should be rethinked and renewed. 
de facto now political of neighborship of uh, European Union is a so-called package for different address regional politics. Uh, in particular, the single approach to all uh, countries of Eastern Partnership today appears uh, counterproductive. Uh, and for association trio, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, Eastern Partnership for this moment looks like uh, uh, some kind of reservation. Uh, we would like expedient in this context to modernize the ideology of Eastern Partnership as a project with different speed of partnership to make more pragmatic formats of extension, uh, extensive uh, dialogue of EU plus three, Kiev, Kishinev and Tbilisi, and formally defined for this association trio the prospects for membership in the EU. I understand this is a very complicated issue. It uh, requires a strategic vision of Euro uh, by European Union of further waves of uh, extension and the terms of that. But uh, without this, for this association three years, the further process of Euro integration will look like participation uh, in a race uh, without finish line. So it's a very complicated issue, I'll tell it again, and we understand it completely. Uh, third, uh, second issue, it's a growing of security component in our partnership. I would like to recall the thesis from uh, summary of uh, recent summit between the EU and the USA uh, about uh, decisiveness in support of sovereignty, independence and territorial, uh, territorial integrity of Eastern partners of the EU, support of Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova on the way of reforms. Uh, now the factor of soft power promoting democracy and rule of law uh, is effective uh, also uh, only uh, coupled with the factor of security, because democratic achievements should be well protected. Uh, the third issue, it's a long lasting lack of strategy of the EU on Russian direction and underestimation of negative influence of Russian factor. I would like to recall that Ukraine has paid for its uh, European choice, the highest price, more than uh, 13,000 of people killed, 1.5 million of TDPs and 7% of territory. Uh, these days, a new strategy of the EU towards Russia has been represented, and we uh, think it's a step in the right direction. Uh, and uh, the last but not least, uh, the strategy of democratization and stabilization of uh, neighbor countries requires also a big financial resources. Otherwise, it uh, takes risk not to be efficient enough. Uh, because of that, the toolbox of the EU in promoting democracy in Eastern direction may also presuppose a component of deepening of economic, uh, economic relations. For example, uh, Ukraine accounts for just over 1% of the EU's trade balance. Instead, the EU account for almost 41% of Ukrainian trade. At the same time, there are few goods with high added value in the commodity group of Ukrainian export. Summarizing, I'd like to uh, stress uh, that uh, today's realities and challenges been brought to the agenda uh, question of new quality of the EU policy uh, policy in Eastern direction, especially in political, economic, and security spheres. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri, for um, I think a very clear call for renewal of an Eastern of the Eastern Partnership and uh, a clear articulation also of the need for this kind of um, stronger involvement. Next, we will hear from Dr. Florent Martiac, who is a senior fellow with the Center Centre International de Formation Européenne in Nice and in Berlin, and also Deputy Secretary General and Research Fellow with the Austro-French Center for Rapprochement in Europe in Vienna. And he promised to share with us an ethical perspective on the question of enlargement. So we're looking forward to hearing more. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Um, actually, Irena, Irena mentioned um, if unfair, that something is unfair. And I think this is a, a term which I hear more and more and which we need to take very seriously. Uh, if you remember, uh, I'll start with this, the alchemists, when they were looking for the Philosopher's Stone, they thought it was a, a, a technical problem. Um, so they had to try things out. Uh, they will find the technical solution. The stone exists. In the end, uh, what, have, what appears, it was a, very much an epistemological um, uh, issue. They had just the false axioms. Uh, so they were looking for something which does not exist. 
um, the EU, to some like to some extent, treats a little bit the flows of its enlargement policy at the same level as a methodological problem. And we try to add a little bit conditionality here to 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 talk about qualified majority um, uh, voting there. We we talk about uh, um, uh, methodological fixing of the issues. Whereas the problem could be actually deeper than that and could be ethical uh, very much. And I will try to, 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 uh, um, uh, to spot uh, uh, three ethical um, uh, positions we are approaching enlargement towards and why these ethical positions are also causing some issues themselves, um, uh, so which we need to address uh, through uh, different kinds of ethical approaches. The first one, which is not only limited to uh, enlargement. This is the, the, the mainstream uh, ethical uh, approach um, to international affairs. This is utilitarianism. Um, so the EU is somehow looking for win-win solutions. It is looking for win-win solutions with the Western Balkans. Um, it's also uh, trying to sell uh, to its citizen uh, the benefits of enlargement. Um, so in this kind of utility, utility is a yardstick for the reason behind uh, enlargement. The problem with that uh, approach of, uh, of enlargement um, is that utility changes uh, depending on context, depending on, 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 on political communities, and so states too, over time. Um, so it makes the whole process very unpredictable if uh, uh, utility uh, or utilitarianism um, uh, is dominant. Um, another ethical positions or justification for enlargement, if you, if you will, is merit, individual merits. So the EU should enlarge because accession is a merit-based uh, process. Conditionality um, is a proof of that. And um, success is deservingness. So uh, the enlargement uh, should come um, because the countries deserve that. The problem, there are two problems. First of all, uh, the accession is not de facto a merit-based uh, so process. Um, we've heard Irena about that. Um, so the, in the member states do not follow necessarily these ethics. And, uh, but more generally, even if it worked, having a, a, an ethic based, so a merit-based ethic to enlargement uh, has some, some un unexpected consequences. Uh, the winners, feel very empowered, very proud to have succeeded, where the laggards, um, well, it is up to them, they could not do it. So it, it encourages this kind of hubris of, of winners and resentment among the losers. It is something which is not encouraging uh, social, uh, social harmony um, in the region. So uh, this, is, this is linked to conditionality. There is another aspect of it. Um, it empowers techno so a technocratic culture of governance because merit is, is, is assessed by technocrats. Uh, it's not it's not at a common good which is which is so much uh, uh, valued the third one we could say is a so a deontological uh, approach to ethics so the eu should engage because because it's about peace it's a peace project the eu um, so accession is somehow the, the ultimate stage of maturation uh, for for states uh, after they have transformed and um, in building this community. The thing is like, uh, it is very much built on a fable, a, a myth. Um, uh, so he, he, there's an interesting video by, by, by Tim, uh, so Timothy Snyder about it, which he called the fable of the, the wiser nations. The EU, when the, so the, the, the initial member states joined, so created the EU, they were waging wars everywhere, colonial wars, imperial wars. They were debris of, of, uh, of imperial states, which collapsed. Um, so the, uh, for the earlier ones, and later for the Eastern countries, there were debris of Soviet Union, um, uh, so polities also collapsing. So my point is presenting the EU as a union of wiser nation uh, tends to suggest that we are better than the Western Balkans and the project of, of European in, in, in Union needs to, to be a little bit sacralized. Whereas de facto what happened in history, it was just a, a salvage project for communities, politics, political communities, which were very much struggling. Uh, so we should not forget that um, because we benefited uh, in the view of that. There is no dividing line uh, which can be uh, ethically um, uh, justified between the Western Balkans and the other countries. I'm finishing by, by saying three things uh, now very shortly, which it, we, we need to consider. What kind of implications do we have? If we read at these flows, first, Ethically, we need to, to get in our heads that we will have to get to, to, to accept countries which are not ready to get in the EU. That's the first thing. 
this is to alleviate the, the, the problem of the utilitarian ethics. It's not, it's inevitable uh, to have countries which will not be ready. It's also going against the merit based. We will have to consider more, op more openly uh, the, the common goods. In the region, it's, it's again an individual approach. We need a regional approach because the common good go goes beyond this bilateral state-to-state -state, uh, uh, relation between the EU and the countries of the region. And third, we need to desacralize the EU as, 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 as achievement of maturation for, 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 for nations. It's a salvage uh, project, uh, and that's why it applies so well to countries which need it most uh, now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florent, for sharing this original take and also uh, for walking us through some of the practical implications that, um, that this would have in terms of EU policy. The, the final um, speaker in our pa panel is an official representative of the Slovenian European Council of Representative, uh, Presidency sorry, that brings us together in this pre-presidency conference. Peter Gerg is the National Coordinator for the Western Balkans for Slovenia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Peter, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself, please? Thank you very much, Natasha, and uh, thank you to organizers for inviting me to this uh, interesting conference. Um, first of all, um, while listening to Florent now and understand why he's a doctor and I'm not, you know, <laughs> because uh, uh, you could see that uh, behind his thinking, uh, there is a great amount of work and uh, a process of uh, trying to understand uh, how the whole enlargement uh, policy is working. Uh, I would like to be a little bit more uh, maybe superficial, but also a little bit more uh, clear in a sense that I think what we have right now in the enlargement process of the European Union is the absence of strategic decision. I think this strategic decision about enlargement has not been uh, truly taken by all the members of European Union. And uh, while uh, we have this absence, uh, we are trying to fill it with uh, tactical instruments. What do I mean? What do I mean? I mean, you know, uh, with the enlargement process in the last 10 years, we have been uh, every year or two years uh, inventing new and new mechanisms, instruments, which, you know, in a sense, uh, should bring the region closer to the European Union. But they were just, they're tools, you know, they are uh, tactical instruments in order to uh, make the process more efficient. But they are not, and they cannot replace a strategic decision based on political will, based on ambition, based on passion, in order to uh, bring this region closer to European Union. Uh, I think a lot of uh, you used some metaphors. Uh, let me do it also. I mean, you know, for me, it seems this region of the Western Balkans is like an unwanted child. You know, it's yours. You know, you know that you have to take it into the house. You just don't want to yet, or you don't know how to do it in order that everybody is happy. And as all unwanted children, you know, they, then they turn to their own devices, they turn to uh, the other actors or other uh, people. And this is what we are having right now uh, in these relations between uh, EU and the Western Balkans. I'm not saying nothing was done. I say, I'm saying that we are using uh, tactical instruments uh, because we haven't really had a proper strategic discussion inside of European Union why it's necessary, why it's important to uh, bring these countries uh, into the EU family. You know? And I hope that uh, also this debate on the future of Europe 
is going to address uh, this important question uh, of enlargement, of uh, where the borders of Europe are, of uh, what and how should we deal in the future with the countries of the Eastern neighborhood. I saw and I listened to what Yuri was saying. I think the same applies also to these countries, you know. How do we match ambitions of others? And how do we, because we are the European continent, work together in order to preserve the best project uh, ever in history? Because I truly believe that European Union is something that uh, is uh, truly remarkable. And in this sense, uh, I would like to point a couple of things that the uh, Slovenian presidency of European Union would like uh, to do in the next six months. First of all, uh, of course, uh, you know, and the Irena was alluding to that. I think if we want to send a signal of hope, if we want to send a signal of enlargement big, being in the geostrategic uh, uh, area of uh, European Union, then uh, we need to start uh, negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania. I think this is something that is crucial. It's something that uh, will show that enlargement is uh, still alive, that it's something of a policy which uh, for European Union is important. Because let's note one thing, and this thing is important. And this is why I was talking about these tactical uh, instruments. We have adopted a new methodology on enlargement. I think it was in May last year, or it was even in April. I don't know. I don't remember. Since then, we haven't opened one, not even one chapter, cluster or whatever, with any country of European Union, of Western Balkans. Not one. So it means that it's not about instruments. It's about political will. And I think with, with the absence of political will, you know, we are always then replacing this proper enlargement policy with things which are important, which uh, slowly bring your, uh, countries of the region closer to the European Union, but they are not enough. I'm talking about connectivity policy, I'm talking about Berlin process, I'm talking about BW, and I'm talking about all the processes which are happening in the relations between uh, EU and Western Balkans. There's a lot of them. And there is also a lot of resources. I mean, European Commission is not going is now going to uh, earmark, I think, nine billion euros for uh, the connectivity projects. But all this, it's not enough without a tangible enlargement uh, process. Because this enlargement policy is the one who is transforming the countries, who is uh, bringing the values, the norms, and everything that the uh, European Union represents. So this is one thing. Second thing is this parallelism. On one side, continuing enlargement. On the second, second side, uh, doing all the connectivity uh, projects which are necessary to uh, bring uh, the region closer to infrastructural, economic, and uh, energy corridors of European Union. So we hope that uh, with this new economic and investment plan of European Commission, some of the things are going to go a little bit faster and be uh, implemented. Third thing. Uh, green agenda decarbonization. I think this is a huge story. This is something that we would like to really uh, bring forward also in the Western Balkans. But again, you know, something is uh, saying it and uh, completely other thing is doing it. So here again, you know, it will have to, we will have to have uh, resources. We will have to have uh, some common understanding from everybody, not just European Union, but also US, who is very interested in uh, decarbonization and green agenda projects in the Western Balkans to really move in fast and with the governments of the region, make an action plan on how this would be uh, actually viable. And then uh, fourth thing, uh, cybersecurity. This is very important for us. We think that, you know, the world is changing. Uh, we are not fighting with uh, tanks anymore. It's more about hybrid warfare. It's fake news. It's so on and so on. And this cybersecurity phenomenon is something that uh, is important also in uh, the countries of the region. And finally, one thing which is uh, which I'm always advocating, and 
it's on the top of my mind. This is the perspective of the young people of the region. But again, here, uh, it's my personal opinion. And I, I'm, I'm quite disappointed on how much we were talking about this and how little was done. Okay, we have RICO now in place in Tirana, which is a phenomenal thing. And it's something that uh, is uh, functioning, it's bringing results, but I think a lot of implementation of a lot of uh, good things uh, in order to alleviate you know, the suffering of the young people. And uh, as we all know, the region has quite a huge problem, not just about uh, brain drain, but just all people from all the uh, countries just leaving uh, the region. And here is something that uh, we would like to do something about, uh, flagship program of European Commission, Youth Guarantee is something that we would like to uh, really uh, start implementing uh, faster. So this is for the beginning. Uh, I'm very much open to all the questions and uh, suggestions on uh, how to move this uh, policy forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for, for some insight into what the concrete priorities of the Slovenian um, Council Presidency will be, and also for emphasizing this important role of um, political will, of course, for, for any um, uh, progress to occur in the region. And I would now like to invite each of you to reflect briefly on the guiding question of this panel, which is um, to what extent have EU tools to promote democracy and rule of law work to bring change to a European neighborhood? And I'm sure you can think of a lot of limitations of these tools. Um, it would be great to hear not only about those, but perhaps also to share some concrete suggestions that you um, have on what the EU may um, improve in the future to, um, to lead to more successful results in this area. And I would suggest we um, we go back in the original order of the um, of the panel. So we would start with um, Irena, if you want to come in here. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, North Macedonia is a clear cut example that the EU has tools to promote democracy and uh, the rule of law and is able to bring change to its neighborhood. Best examples to support this thesis include the involvement in the EU in ending the political crisis and the state capture and the Persian agreement. The deliberation on regional and national status considering these challenges is crucial since it's omnipresent and goes hand in hand with the prolonged EU integration. Namely, the absence of clear viable EU perspective is fairly responsible for the Western Balkan malas. It has most undoubtedly produced a great level of Euroscepticism over time. However, what we really need to be concerned is actually the future of the process itself and how do we counter the diminishing effect of the delay. Why? Because of the conventional wisdom that the region and uh, North Macedonia uh, will not become part of the Union anytime soon. Even um, if the negotiation uh, uh, start and are open now, we will most certainly see the end of the process in a decade or so. So simply by enumerating all the years past since we began the process, we can very well find people, uh, a whole generation of people that were involved at the beginning of uh, Macedonia's path towards the EU integration that are now senior and retired, not just tired. Um, the state of the rule of law in accession countries is, of course, a central issue because at the end, what matters is not whether our, our courts, our, um, our prosecutor's uh, office, our public broadcasting service are independent on paper, but whether they are independent in reality uh, when put under uh, uh, stress. And this is true with all and everything related to our laws, which um, uh, obviously have texts that appear to be a perfect copy of your laws. Beyond the fact that we really need to work on law implementation strategies, we clearly lack policymaking tools that will eventually infuse, or uh, if you prefer, in some cases, increase the integrity of, of institutions. So eventually they would be able to act in a, in a politically impar impartial manner, uh, be resistant to pressures, uh, uh, pushing towards corruptive practices, and most importantly, they would be able to perform in a preventive mode when, when needed. Um, it is against this background that we need action starting from ensuring uh, legal uh, certainty, annulling any possibility uh, for procurement for projects that favor politically associated local subcontractors 
and seem to be the bed of many political and business careers, uh, pushing for reforms of the state administration, advancing educational and health policies, and so on and so forth. Evidently, uh, regional and national institutions uh, continue to lack resilience to corruptive business contracts. So um, high level corruption cases keep popping up uh, while others uh, remain unclosed. Now, EU has ample tools at, this, uh, at its disposal that can further the promotion of democracy and the rule of law. And by directing and guiding the implementation, it can most certainly bring change to accession countries. The best approach is to continue and uh, when and where necessary, enhance monitoring, assistance, and overall presence at accession countries. So groups that are already here to keep on intense in-depth assessments on key uh, real, uh, rule of law issues by focusing not only on the institutional setting, that is on the form, but on the results, that is on the content. Following the successful outcomes of this kind of engagement, such as the PRIVA report, Further in-depth monitoring and in-depth assessment proved as essential and should be welcomed and supported. With regards to democracy, only a step forward to accession, again, can, assist, can assist the bettering of the democratic health and shifting the discourse away from stabilitocracy, which has dominated the political agenda and policy towards the region for so long. And ultimately, without a positive response soon, I'm afraid that the door is open for any and every possible scenario. Let's not forget that 18 years have passed since the EU made its original promise of membership to the six Western Balkan countries at the Thessaloniki summit. And the maturity of the policy seems to be aged enough uh, so it can be implemented. Uh, further stalling of the process will for surely affect the EU as well by making its leverage lose its edge. And um, eventually the Europeanization of the Western Balkans, including all of its challenges will slow down and stop, which is of course an unwelcome scenario for all. Thank you, Irina. We'll go right on to Rudy. And perhaps just to invite all of you for this um, back and forth exchange, we'll have one more uh, open question to Keep your comments brief so that we can also um, address some of the questions that are starting to pop up in the chat and um, maybe directly from the audience. Over to you, Yuri. Uh, thank you. Again, let me start with, uh, again, this brief historic overview of uh, this issue, how successful uh, EU uh, instruments to promote democracy and rule of law. Because, uh, in fact, uh, as I started, uh, Ukraine started the pro process of Europeanization of the political institutions in the beginning of 90s. And to the beginning of 2000, we already have a political system uh, and the system of governmental institutions very uh, maybe uh, similar to the EU members, uh, at least uh, EU members and new members who joined the EU in 2004 and as a way of, of uh, enlargement of 2004. Uh, after that, we have a different periods with different success. Uh, some of them were more successful, some of them less. And it uh, depends on the different factors. And first of all, uh, conditionality may be successful from Ukrainian example, if in the end there is some tangible result for the people and for political elites. Uh, the most successful period, uh, starting after the uh, Euromaidan and the Revolution of Dignity in 2014 and lasting until 2019, was linked to the promise to Ukraine to have a visa-free regime with the EU countries. And this, uh, it was very powerful tool because the public opinion wanted very strongly and they push political forces in order to adopt legislation necessary for fulfillment of all conditions that uh, has been established by the EU. And all the provisions of uh, association agreement uh, on political association and economic integration. So it was successful experience. But uh, there were some less successful examples. For instance, uh, uh, system uh, reform of judiciary system. There were several approaches under different 
presidents with the participation of EU and other international partners of Ukraine, uh, where a position of uh, European experts were changing, it not taking into account uh, sufficiently a real situation and real design of the system and circumstances under which it works. Uh, for instance, uh, Venice Commission in uh, different years give uh, very contradictory uh, advice uh, in relation of composition of Supreme uh, 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 Council of Justice. It's a body that appoint and uh, make a disciplinary procedures uh, in regards of judges in Ukraine. So different approaches to composition now, which has changed completely in comparison with the previous one. So. Uh, we also have pick up another examples more or less successful, but in general, uh, it leads uh, us to uh, creating more European uh, introduction of more principles of democ democratization and rule of law, but uh, with uh, some examples that uh, our own peculiarities and conditions, uh, conditions uh, of situation uh, within the country required more efforts to understand and to produce something new, not to uh, try to use the approach one size fits all. So uh, if to summarize, uh, I can uh, just uh, mention some uh, points from our uh, Ukrainian experience that uh, make uh, these efforts more successful. First of all, to take into account peculiarities of society, political system, uh, and also uh, the dominant orientations, value orientations between the people and political elites. And uh, also to uh, put in the end of conditionality, use of instruments, more tangible, uh, uh, tangible promises, valuable for, uh, for people, first of all. And uh, then uh, going from visa-free regime to something other, uh, we inevitably will come to the prospect of membership. And again, now in this situation of Ukraine, uh, it's hardly to imagine something else. Because uh, even now on the level of constitution, uh, we have adopted the provision amendments that the final goal of Ukrainian Euro integration is obtaining a full membership. And it's not, not only view based on our concrete examples of Ukrainian experience, uh, also it is reflected in uh, the theoretical uh, articles uh, written by EU authors that uh, I can quote one of them, that uh, very respectful Tanya Burzel and Frank Schimmel Fenin in the article, the EU's political integration capacity in Eastern Europe, coming to conclusion that we do not find a systematic effect of conditionality in the absence of membership in sentence. So it's also confirmed, but uh, political scientists and uh, then the round is, uh, the, the, the circle is ended on that. And uh, in that I can uh, support uh, Peter in uh, his observations that uh, Western Balkans need to uh, start this process in order to make an example for, for us, for instance, for Eastern uh, partnership countries, that to make it possible that this goal is reachable in the closer or further end, but uh, we must understand it clearly. I think it's, uh, it is very important for success. We have a lot of tasks now to do. We have to uh, continue reform of of governing system, of judiciary, of anti-corruption institution, and so on and so forth. We have a lot of uh, things on agenda, but uh, we have to know that in the end, we will, uh, we will have this possibility. And uh, again, uh, referring to, uh, to Florent uh, comments on different approaches of political philosophy or a value or ethical based uh, approach. Uh, I think that uh, finally, uh, the pragmatic approach uh, for the EU that Ukraine and other Eastern European countries, Eastern partnership countries, may be a benefit for the EU. It's not a burden, it's not a problem, it's a part of solution of some problems. I think that if this approach prevails, probably it will be easier to make strategic decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri, also for clarifying that, of course, the countries of the Eastern Partnership are looking to progress in the Balkans to see some sign of hope um, there and that uh, the absence of any progress there is, is certainly not very encouraging for, for these countries that are kind of second in line. Um, Florent. Uh, yeah. um, 
yes, yes. You're, you're just responding to Yuri very shortly. Yes, we, we have maybe this hope or a delusion that uh, uh, European integration is 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 more than a pragmatic um, uh, construct. Um, but indeed, pragmatism is certainly uh, the mainstream or the main um, uh, vector uh, of calculation or approaching problems. And now to answer the question, I, I, I don't want to stay again at an abstract level, but um, I, I, I will a little bit. But again, coming back to, 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 the, uh, to policy, it's, it very much reminds me uh, a debate which was, um, which was um, happening in four, so one, it was one century ago. There's a Liebman Dewey. Uh, debates. The EU, when it's approaching democracy, it's, it, it's, appro it's approaching democracy in the way uh, Lippmann, uh, so, um, uh, so this uh, political um, uh, philosopher, uh, was conceiving it. Um, that means that the experts have the power in defining what is a democracy, in assessing uh, uh, so the level of democracy in countries. The central role of experts is huge. Um, so that's also reflected um, in the role of the Commission. Then the politicians, what they do is they try to nudge the acceptance um, or to their constituency of what the experts are expecting from them. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing per se. The problem is that Lippmann foresaw, um, and for good reasons, that these kind of democratic constructs fuels us byproduct populism, uh, anti-elite uh, rejection. And this is precisely what we have now, not only in Europe, uh, broader, much broader. The fact that politics is become, is, is become, has become less ideologized, uh, experts um, in economy, and um, also so in, in, so in the EU, it's also then in, um, towards rule of law, um, are very much setting the standards what to do. And citizens are very far from that. Um, so that's the problem. The, the counter argument of the way was that democracy is, is an experimental uh, project. We don't ask experts, uh, experts, we try, we try things out from the bottom rather than top down. And this is what the EU is not doing, but maybe could try to some extent. It's not an either or, but it's rather balancing a little bit the approaches with the Western Balkans. It certainly does not help when the Western Balkan citizens are not, are not involved, are not included, so whether in the Conference on the Future of Europe, but also in the making on, of the norms which then apply to them. It's a, a non-negotiated uh, process, unilateral from the EU, the EU demands and you will use the civil society organization to make sure that this is applied. But in terms of resilience and sustainability of change, it's much better if you design a standards together with the first concerns, because they will have a so an additional incentive in respecting that. So it's, it's a little bit this approach uh, which can be a little bit thought through. Concretely, concretely, I, I, I would have just two final points, very short, um, to strengthen uh, other ideas, to strengthen um, that. I would think about uh, civic, civic education, EU civic education. When we think about um, uh, democracy, is it strengthening democracy? Uh, that's one thing, but we, we should also think about EU democracy. Is it strengthening EU democracy? It is a different level of democracy. And the way we conceive ourselves as citizens, as EU citizens, I am really not sure we are preparing the citizens of the countries in the region to become EU citizens. Uh, it's, not, it's not the way national states would prepare their, their, their own citizens and constituencies. Uh, uh, so, but the EU has this very top-down uh, way of, 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 of doing that. The second thing, and very shortly, is to approach maybe mobility um, as a political project, not as an economic, uh, not as an economic, um, you know, with brain drain or an issue, but very much as an as as, as a political European political project. If you if you I, I will not say force because it's too much, but if you incentivize a lot people to move around, uh, you are creating different routes for them. You are broadening the horizons. You are expanding, giving room to this uh, European citizenship. Um, uh, acknowledgement. If people stay, and it, 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 it is as much for EU member states as for, for West Balkans, but if they stay where they are born, or maybe move a little bit in the same country, 
EU democracy will remain uh, uh, somehow a little bit abstracting. They may have a national democracy, but to make it leave, you need to, to, to urge people to move around and to settle somewhere, to get married to other people and so on. This is how you develop this kind of, uh, of European community, um, which, uh, which we could work on. Thank you very much, Florent. And um, we're, we'll turn now to um, to Peter. I would like to invite you, apart from reflecting on the initial question, to perhaps also pick up on this first question in this chat by Dr. Anna bojinovic Fenko, um, asking you how Slovenia is concretely contributing to um, making enlargement a strategic decision by EU member states. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natasha. And uh, also, um, thanks for the question from uh, Anna. I'm going to be, yes, I'm going to be quite practical. Regarding your question on the tools, yes, of course. As I was explaining already in the beginning, we have all the tools uh, necessary to uh, bring uh, this region into the European Union. Uh, the problem is that we are not using them uh, efficiently. We are not using them uh, in the right manner. Uh, saying that, of course, you know, it always takes two to tango and uh, there is uh, you know, this uh, lack of urgency on the side of the European Union, but there is also a lack of urgency on the side of the political elite in the region to actually move forward with the necessary uh, reforms. So when, you know, we all sit down at a table and strategically agree that uh, this is something that needs to be done, then uh, things are going to go uh, much quicker and much easier. What are we doing practically? Well, one thing, which uh, for me, it's very important. And I think that uh, it could provide this setting for uh, this kind of debate is of course, uh, EU Western Balkan Summit, which uh, it's going to take place on the 6th of October during uh, Slovenian presidency in Slovenia. And we hope to use, you know, this top echelon of, uh, politicians uh, and political elites in Europe and Western Balkans coming together to see uh, and to really sit down and discuss how we can all collectively bring this uh, region uh, closer to European Union. So in practical terms, you know, uh, we also hope that uh, the inclusion of countries of the region into the whole conference or on the debate on the future of Europe is also an opportunity to hear this voice of uh, why it is important uh, that uh, this region, which geographically is in the heart of Europe, also becomes uh, uh, part of European uh, of European Union. So, in this sense, uh, we really hope that uh, you know, with a new emphasis on the on the Western Balkans, and we can see that. Uh, there's a lot of discussions going on right now. We have the summit of Berlin process on the 5th of July. We have, as I said, uh, summit of EU Western Balkans on the 6th of October. We have enlargement reports. We then have European Council uh, in December. These are the dates which are important because these kind of decisions I was talking about can only be taken at the top level. And uh, we are providing a setting for these kind of decisions to take place. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And um, as many of you will know, one of the main elements of TEPS's pre-presidency conference is the preparation of a set of recommendations to the incoming European Council presidency. And um, I had the pleasure to draft these recommendations in the area of EU enlargement. And there were three recommendations put forward. Uh, first, to open negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia in order to translate the long promised credible membership perspective into a concrete and tangible process of negotiation. Second, to engage beyond the government um, in order to ensure sustainable and broadly supported reforms um, by enhancing collaboration with parliamentarians and ministerial staff, but also relevant civil society organizations and to foster more participatory policymaking. This also goes into the direction of um, Florence's remark regarding the importance of civic education and preparing the wider population for accession. And finally, to support an effective response to the COVID-19 pandemic in the Western Balkans, both by providing direct support by, um, to local health systems and ongoing vaccination campaigns, but also by preparing more long-term measures to address the pandemic's political and economic impact in the region. And we'd like to um, perhaps go, go back to Peter at uh, first as the official representative of the Slovenian presidency to share his thoughts regarding these recommendations. 
And I'll then invite the other panelists to identify what they may say as um, uh, additional priorities for the incoming presidency. Thank you, uh, Natasha. Well, basically, what I can say is that uh, it's a shame you're not working for us, you know, for the presidency, because uh, uh, these recommendations are exactly the ones that uh, we also are trying to implement during our uh, six, man, six months uh, presidency, meaning that in terms of uh, including civil society, and we agree, you know, without this, uh, nothing is going to move because civil society is the one who is uh, making checks and balances uh, to the political elites, elites and pushing, putting pressure on them to uh, move forward with the reform processes. We will try to also uh, involve them in the preparations for the EU Western Balkan Summit, maybe even on the margins, uh, organize a conference, which would be dedicated uh, on civil society, their views, their ideas, their suggestions on uh, the future of Europe debate, in what kind of you know Europe they would want to live. Because as I said many times, if we are talking about the future and we are not including countries of the Western Balkans, then this means that enlargement is dead. It means that you know if the countries which should and uh, will be part of the European Union uh, are not included in how and in what kind of European Union they would like to come to, then uh, we have a big, big problem. So, you know, we hope that uh, with this, we will also keep a voice to these people, especially uh, young people in civil society uh, organizations to, to put forward uh, their ideas. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'll invite the other three to, to, to identify perhaps one, one main priority. And at the same time, I would like to already um, open the floor to um, the participants to um, either raise your hand if you would like to ask a question directly or otherwise to, to, to write the question into the chat. I think we have at least one um, question there already that we'll, uh, that we'll share and then we'll have really plenty of time to, um, to accept more. So perhaps in the, in the reverse order this time, so going, uh, going to Florent. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't have one. I have, a, I have maybe four, but very shortly. The first one it goes very shortly because it's it's petters. I mean, it is, I think it is a main one. It's a very important one. This conference on the future of Europe. This sends a terrible message uh, if if we don't find a room to 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 um, uh, to, to to involve to, to involve them. Uh, so I, I completely agree. The second one um, is, uh, but it's not a new one. It's it's again the Kosovo visa liberalization. I mean, this is this is uh, this is again a shame. It's a two standard thing. I mean, if we want to be a, a principled uh, EU uh, based on values, uh, we cannot have two uh, so double standards. Uh, approach to this issue. The fact that uh, Ukraine, Georgia, uh, Moldova have uh, visa liberalization, Kosovo has not, um, cannot be justified in any ways, uh, to be honest. Um, so that's, a, that's the, first, uh, the second one. The third one uh, is a little bit more daring, um, uh, but uh, it, it resonates with uh, the ambitions uh, the commission set to itself, so it's for itself of being geopolitical uh, uh, commission. Uh, I don't understand how the EU can have the ambition to become geopolitical if we ha still have five countries which are non recognizer uh, uh, of Kosovo. I mean, how can we uh, so aim or, uh, so, uh, or strive for a common uh, approach to big players like Russia, China and others, big topics when we are not even able to develop a common approach towards uh, Kosovo? Um, so how to do that concretely? Some démarche could be initiated. Uh, it's, 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 it's like completely empty what is done here. Um, uh, so trying to launch some dynamic at least. Um, I know this will not happen to, tomorrow, but some dynamic of consultation. How can we, can we, can we progress on that topic? Um, I will just stop there. I would still have a few. <laughs> Thank you very much, Florent. Feel free to bring them in and the discussion in a minute. Um, Juraj, uh, over to you. Uh, yes, I, uh, I would like, if you afford, to turn back to uh, recommendations. Uh, uh, I think it's very, very relevant document, and it's a very good practice of political scientists to prepare for decision makers such such a proposals. What I would like to probably to see there, uh, as I told uh, already, it's a priority, such priority as uh, rethinking and modernization of uh, policy uh, of Eastern neighborhood. Neighborhood, and especially uh, some differentiation for association trio uh, to which Ukraine belongs. And also, uh, I have a couple of uh, our own recommendations uh, how we see 
uh, will be probably better to make promotion of democracy and rule of law in uh, our countries, especially in Ukraine. Uh, first proposal is to uh, strengthen the uh, institutional framework for cooperation with the EU in the field of justice or, and home affairs through so participation and cooperation in a system of relevant European institutions, European network of judges, interdisciplinary platform for combating criminal threats, uh, European anti-fraud office, EU public prosecutors office and, uh, as well. And the second general uh, proposal uh, to use the tool that has been implemented for the Western Balkans also for Eastern direction for Ukraine, Georgia, and for Moldova. It's a whole toolbox. I think it's not necessary to uh, name the, uh, here in, in this discussion. And third component, uh, it's the uh, importance of strengthening security, uh, security component, uh, and it should be noted uh, separately, including uh, questions of security missions, uh, bilateral and multilateral military, military technical cooperation, combative of uh, cyber uh, uh, the threats, uh, and so on and so forth. So these three components as uh, more communication uh, in uh, acting institutions, expanding of uh, toolbox for Western Balkans through Eastern partnership and security component. I think it will be more very valuable for general uh, think of promotion of democracy, rule of law, and approaching of Ukraine and CEO countries to the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri and Irena. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Natasha, personally, uh, for your uh, work on the, on the recommendations. Uh, secondly, I believe that adding additional, uh, let's call them big issues or matters to the, uh, to the agenda may be uh, overloading, may be unreachable for the, uh, for the six uh, months that uh, Slovenia has uh, as a mandate with its presidency. Um, I agree with much of, of what Florent and what uh, Yuri have, have said, not to uh, repeat what they have said. And I really praise the stance of Mr. Kirk on including the Western Balkans on the uh, future of Europe debate. And I truly hope that the summit that is planned in October uh, will produce some uh, more tangible, tangible results. Thank you very much. And um, we already have the first questions in the uh, in the chat, but also orally. So I'll I'll invite uh, Yap Dezan to, to ask his questions. Hi, thank you. So I make myself uh, visible. Thank you very much for uh, the topic. It's very important as well as the discussion so far. Um, my main point is that indeed, I think we are losing a lot of time. Nobody can deny that we all have an interest to create stability all over the continent. Uh, I mean, references to the European Union as a global player. We cannot disappoint the citizens expecting with regard to stability, prosperity, etc. So we have to do something. Now, unfortunately, uh, the European Union started with a group of like-minded countries, et cetera, et cetera. And we have to recognize, fully recognize, that, of course, uh, instead of uh, homogeneity, we have now arrived in a situation of heterogeneity. However, my point is that uh, whereas originally we were tempted to start the exercise by assessing whether candidate countries fully respect the fundamental values for uh, accession, which I mentioned Article 2 in connection with Article 49, that of course in the context of the Western Balkans may take a while. Let's be very honest. The references are to exchanges, education, network for, for judiciary, et cetera. I mean, internships, what have you, institution building, but it may take some time. Let's be honest about that. But meanwhile, we can achieve a lot where we are just focusing cooperation on areas of mutual interest. I mentioned two, but there are many more. I mean, the public health area has been mentioned. So, I mean, I also think that with regard to security, foreign policy, asylum, immigration, it's crystal clear that we have common interests to bring those countries closer to the European continent. And we have to cre create 
perhaps a better uh, structure. So perhaps we have to, to reform slightly the modality of the Eastern Parja, make it a bit stronger, but also to make it a framework which respect the expectations and our own interest for stability on our continent. That's uh, essentially the merits of the comments I would like to bring in in this useful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaap. Who, who would like to come in on this? Go ahead, Florent. So very shortly on time, I think it's an important factor uh, we 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 uh, we tend to neglect that, and uh, I think you're completely right. It will take a lot of time if we take seriously the criteria, the Copenhagen criteria, like really a lot. Um, regardless of all the level of unpredictability coming from the me some member states blocking here and there, um, uh, so uh, the roads. Um, now the problem is that uh, we we are in fa so we are facing some contradictions. Uh, to some level. The EU tries to position itself as a, as a, a geopolitical actor. Uh, geopolitical actor means that uh, there is the idea of geo so geopolitics, geography, but also time is very much in it. Now, so the, the geopolitics is about time, controlling time, things are going very fast. And I'm not talking just about, um, about cyber and, and all of that, but the political time has accelerated a lot. We have a, so also a, a philosophers talking about that in, in beautiful ways, the acceleration of time. My point is that so offering um, accession perspectives, which might maybe uh, uh, be fulfilled, so fulfilled in 20, 30, 50 years, it's in complete disconnect um, with the political time, which goes 10 times faster. So geopolitically, it, it, it resonates completely empty. Um, because we cannot do geopolitics by offering something uh, which will happen in 20, 30 years. And Russia has understood that very well, because it, it has adopted that as one of the narrative against the EU in the region, saying, look, you will never get in the EU. The EU is just talking, 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 but it's just blocking all the, also all the way through. It's very difficult to have, this is my point, it's very difficult to have uh, at the same time, uh, um, uh, so an ambition of become, uh, becoming a geopolitical actor when we cannot uh, handle or put um, uh, the enlargement um, uh, perspective uh, in a time frame which is politically, hand so which can be handled politically. And that's not uh, the time we have now. So we are facing a kind of dilemma. You, anyone else uh, and here otherwise I would yeah Peter go ahead. yeah no just uh, shortly uh, three things uh, one is basically in the recent uh, times we moved from a multilateral to multipolar world and we can see this uh, if you look at uh, how the things are moving on in this uh, international uh, arena which is a shame but this is how it goes so we have to adapt or uh, we need some time to uh, change this again. And we will see how with the new American administration and this push for a new multilateralism, which actually nobody explained what it means, but it's there, uh, we will see where we will go. But we live in a multipolar world and this world uh, needs strategic decisions. Uh, von der Leyen, you know, uh, president of European Commission said, uh, at the beginning of uh, the mandate of this commission that this is going to be a more geostrategic commission. Uh, I still di didn't or haven't seen that, but yes, it needs it needs to be, you know, it needs to be. And uh, time is of essence. Time is of essence because, you know, we can, and I totally agree with uh, Yap that uh, we need to continue with this whole connectivity agenda, economic approaches, uh, you know, uh, building up regional common market. But these are not the values. You know, we need the values. We need the transformation in order for uh, this region to, to move forward. And uh, time is of essence. This is why I'm saying put positive pressure, you know, be active, be we are just worrying, you know, we are all the time, we are worrying. When I'm talking to my colleagues, you know, they say, you know, I'm, I'm very worried about the Western Balkans. Well, I have been worried for 20 years and it didn't change a lot, you know. We should stop being just worried and do something about it because other players are actually doing something about it. 
they are building roads, they are building railways, they are moving in uh, in terms of uh, strategic communication, they are moving in in terms of uh, policy, in terms of uh, everything. And it's not happening in the Balkans only, it's happening in the Eastern Partnership. I mean, even more if you look at uh, the current situation in some of the countries. So this is what I'm saying. Let's be active, let's not wait, because if you are going to wait, uh, things are not going to be done by themselves. It's, it's impossible. It's not the way uh, of the world as one book was uh, written in the 60s. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. I'd, I'd like to bring a question here from the chat, which is from the uh, ambassador of Bosnia and Herzegovina, asking um, basically if I understand correctly about the possibility for, given that the Western Balkans were initially part of, of the same country of Yugoslavia, to have a common approach for the entire region. So um, if, if I interpret this question, uh, should we have another big bank enlargement the way we had it for Central and Eastern Europe? And I think that the question was asked directly to Peter, but I think it has, of course, important implications, both from an ethical perspective of what uh, Florent was saying, merit-based versus um, kind of a group-based uh, approach. But it would also be interesting to hear um, Irena's view on, uh, would this be an advantage, for instance, to North Macedonia, or may it call it even further back for um, yeah, how, how best to deal with this uh, big bang versus individual level? Maybe if I... Uh, uh take it off, uh, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, I understood this question a little bit differently. Uh, what Ambassador was asking is, uh, should Croatia and uh, Slovenia as two countries of the former Yugoslavia now members of the EU have the common approach towards uh, the Western Balkans? Um, it's a tricky question, I understand it. Uh, it's a question which, however I answer, it's going to be wrong, so, <laughs> so uh, but let me try, I mean, I think in the recent years, Croatia and Slovenia have been the most significant proponents of uh, enlargement uh, to the Western Balkans. I mean, we have been the ones who are putting this uh, subject and issues on the agenda of the European Union. We wrote uh, letters uh, saying that, I mean, the last letter was uh, regarding Bosnia and Herzegovina, which we co-signed together. Uh, so in terms of activity, of course, I think uh, we are, the region's best friends because it's, I mean, it's not because of altruism, but it's because it's in our own interest. You know, we need stability, we need progress in this region because it's on our, on our doorstep. Uh, but of course, you know, every country has uh, also its own interest uh, and uh, these interests uh, differ uh, from country to country. But uh, at the end of the day, I think on this strategic level of uh, why the region is important for European Union, I think uh, Croatia and Slovenia uh, feel, think, and also are uh, acting uh, in the same uh, in the same way. Thank you, Peter. And indeed, uh, rereading the question that is the the appropriate interpretation. And I would still like to put the question about the uh, about the Big Bang uh, collective versus merit based approach to um, to the other three um, panelists, because I think it's it's a discussion that crops up regularly um, in the face of the even the front runners being uh, extremely slow in their progress. I think it's a it's a relevant question, but of course it does pose a number of uh, political and also ethical issues. How best to go about it? Irena, would you like to come in on this? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you. Um, I believe that the policy of um, of enlargement in uh, the policy of accession uh, should work uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, accepting new members after getting the, ass the assurance that the process of reintegration is based on the achievements of, of a country. Now, this can be uh, problematic for the Balkans uh, because some are uh, doing uh, very well, some are, are not. Um, for example, um, uh, regarding North Macedonia, uh, the people who have been involved for a lot of time in the process uh, say that North Macedonia is probably one of the best prepared candidates, which cannot be, for example, said of uh, Kosovo, let's say, or uh, other uh, Western Balkan countries. Uh, uh, strategically speaking, uh, uh, a potential big bank would for certain stabilize the, the region. It will produce uh, stability and security. Uh, and evidently EU is well aware of the geopolitical and overall multidimensional importance of the region for the union, chiefly in terms of security. But in order to move forward, the EU needs to assure full respect and uh, implementation of the values of the union by all its members first. 
uh, and effectively heighten its credibility in the region uh, by, by doing something past and now. The opening of accession talks will uh, allow uh, possibilities uh, to absorb all bilateral issues, not just the one we have at the moment, and uh, lower the present tensions. And at the same time, it will provide a venue for development of healthy relations, uh, not just on the relation of a, a accession country and the EU, but between the accession countries themselves, and uh, build a mutual trust and respect. I believe it's a high time that the EU stops overlooking the region and uh, North Macedonia in particular as a predicament and start considering the accession as an added value to the union. After all, uh, uh, when we're talking about North Macedonia in particular, relentless as we may be, the paradigm needs a closure. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Florent. Yeah, um, it's it's a question which which uh, which I always um, I try to to defend quite emotionally. Must admit, but I mean it, the upset says so. so yeah, the, the road will be very long, and I, I I could put my my hand on fire that at some point every single country of the region will be blocked by someone, at some point. We, the, the countries now, they may think, oh, I will not be broke because, uh, because I will go through. No, no, I, I, at some point, guaranteed, if this is a merit-based, one by one, regatta principle, they will all be blocked. So there are two ways to, to, to approach that. Either to say, well, that's the way. The rules are, as are defined by the EU. We follow the rules. And we are a little bit like, I don't say ship, but we are passive. Um, we are passive and following what the EU says. Or we take initiative. And here, I say, I, I mean, of course, the country of the region cannot define uh, the standards, but they can, they can um, uh, create leverage to change the rules of engagement of the EU in, 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 so in, in, in enlargements by putting forth, so forward the concept of solidarity, so intra-regional solidarity, meaning instead of blocking one another, so standing for one another. So, if, for instance, uh, so Macedonia uh, is offered to go forwards, Macedonia could say no, uh, uh, because I would like to go together with Albania or the reverse. Uh, so that's the first thing. Of course, politically, this is complicated. But now uh, there is no room for political engagement. Um, uh, so at that level, at the transnational level, where political parties will defend solidarity standing for for the regions uh, re so regional neighbors there is no room for that they all see uh, and uh, so accession as a national priority no one is defending in the region accession as a regional priority and i believe there could be some room uh, especially uh, so for instance in Mas it's North macedonia but uh, for, for for political actors engaging uh, so more transnationally uh, for that reason the second thing, advantage, is lobbying together. I mean, the countries are so small, they don't have resources to lobby. If you pool resources, you can gain leverage, uh, so uh, more leverage. Together, you're stronger. The third one is to face together uh, blockers. Take Kosovo, five non-recognizers. No one is supporting Kosovo. I mean, for, the no, for, for mild non-recognizers, if you have other countries, neighbors of Kosovo saying, now I'm supporting Kosovo, I, uh, so I am putting my relations to your country uh, in a little bit in dire positions because you're not recognizing my, my neighbor, the country might reconsider his non-recognizing policy uh, if it is not a very stringent one. So it adds to stand together against EU member states blocker. The last thing, and I'm finishing, finishing here, uh, it's getting a little bit ownership um, of the process. This is something I was referring before. So getting citizens and politi so political parties in the position where they are actively engaging uh, in the construction of European integration. That's also teaching, by the way, a lesson to EU member states, saying, look, we can show, demonstrate solidarity by standing for, so for one another, questioning the rule you set for us, while you, in the meantime, in the EU, you're so disunited on some topics. I know that sounds very illusion, uh, so to some level, but I, 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 I wish more people could share this, this delusion. <laughs> Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Florent. Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Florent.
you so well, and I would, um, I would like to perhaps bring in Yui here, because of course there, there is this major difference between the Western Balkans that have a membership perspective and, uh, and the Eastern Partnership countries um, that do not. Could you uh, perhaps reflect a bit on the extent to which um, you, you think, I mean, of course it, it, it impacts this, but what would you, what would the countries of the Eastern Partnership need to have a sufficient incentive to, um, to respond to uh, some of the uh, demands that the EU is making on them? And how does the membership perspective, of course, play into there? Uh, you know, I'd like to turn to from from another to to look from from another another side to the situation because if you speak that uh, the EU is uh, thinking about the further enlargement, it is not in a position of making strategic decision. In the same time, some somebody other is making this decision, and this is our northern partner from the other side. If you if European Union decided not to enlarge anymore in the eastern direction, then Russia has decided already to expand in the western direction we know an example of belarus which is very easily absorbed by russia in fact so the same destiny uh, may await for smaller countries like georgia moldova we have an example of frozen conflicts and obviously ukraine and this war is a reflection of those positions of ukraine that had made the choice in, uh, in the favor of european integration so uh, from geopolitical point of view, it's really uh, probably this process may long uh, some time of enlargement itself. But the decision making should be, uh, we think, has been done in a shorter perspective in order not to give this possibility uh, for our neighbor and the enemy to go further. I think that uh, why I'm uh, stressing every time on security issues and why I'm addressing to these documents that has been yesterday uh, published uh, by the EU. So the uh, possibility for Ukraine to become a member of the EU is a certain constraint for Russia, as it has been said in the relation of NATO membership as well. So because of that, it's so important for us and uh, we are speaking publicly about this desire. Probably it's also uh, a reason why uh, our uh, present president, Mr. Zelensky, is uh, trying to find a bilateral support from different countries assigning these uh, agreements between the EU and bilateral basis with countries who support Ukrainian accession to the EU. So we are going one by one if uh, there is no decision from the center, from Brussels. So, but uh, it's, uh, we, we don't have uh, other choice if we want to be a European country. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yuri, for this uh, realistic, uh, pragmatic uh, view. And so I see we, ha we don't have any further questions um, from the audience, and we are um, getting towards the, um, the, the end of our panel session. So what I would um, perhaps like to invite each of the panelists to do in a, in a final intervention is to reflect in an optimistic scenario, not an ideal scenario, but an optimistic, realistic scenario. Where would you like to see the Western Balkans or the Eastern Partnership region in 2030, so 10 years from now. And I, I suggest we go in the in the order of the original um, panel, so Irina can start off. Well, thank you. Um, hopefully, uh, 2030 uh, should be a date when we would be ending the accession talks. <laughs> but at least hopefully, in order to achieve that, uh, we we really need uh, to move forward and move forward fast uh, because, as I said, uh, uh, the accession talks will take will take long. Not just because of the methodology and the process itself, but the fact that I have mentioned um, a list of challenges that we are facing and we need assistance with. So it's uh, the domestic agenda as well. Um, in addition to uh, uh, really uh, having a problem with, uh, uh, with the domestic agenda on several, uh, several issues. The, the deadlock is overwhelming the Macedonian national discourse, but the context is now much different than the one three years ago when we had to deal with the implications of signing the PRESPA agreement. Um, North Macedonia has done almost everything, some say everything that it was required to do, and in some cases even beyond that in terms of reform, but also bringing the EU at home agenda. The political leverage of our current government is constantly questioned on many levels, and uh, Bulgaria relations being ranking on top of that. So the issue has a potential to produce another political crisis. 
And the public support for your accession is lowering, thus creating a space for EU's credibility to be undermined. The political balance of inter-ethnic relations are delicate and so on and so forth. Uh, therefore, in addition to the fragile democracy styled EU prospects, um, dealing with the pandemics, constant brain drain and pushing for reforms, one has to praise the overall success of the country and uh, even despite its many, many uh, problems out of which uh, uh, some were uh, mentioned, mentioned before uh, and in depth. So hopefully uh, uh, the process of uh, uh, negotiating the bilateral issue that popped out uh, will be immunized and separated from the accession process. And at 2030, we will be sitting uh, on a debate together and discussing discussing other important issues. Thank you. Thank you, Irena. And I will give the remaining ones uh, up to a minute each maximum. So Yuri, what would be your optimistic and yet realistic take for Ukraine and or the Eastern Partnership? Uh, yes, if uh, to look ahead for 10 years to 2030, first of all, I, I would like to see Ukraine as a country that uh, resolved this conflict with Russia and restored territorial integrity in a political way. Uh, then uh, we have to solve our uh, issues of domestic agenda. First of all, reform of judiciary, establishment of rule of law, anti-corruption, and so on. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Ukraine is a country with growing economy. And uh, in a sense of uh, our relations with the EU, I would like to see Ukraine for that moment to be recognized as a candidate and maybe, probably, hopefully, in the process of negotiations. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Very nice and concise too. Florent. Yes, uh, so uh, since the differentiated integration is on the rise, uh, so I, I would like very much to see Western Balkans uh, having some kind of membership status. Um, it can be a membership minus status, um, or if all uh, the members of the European Union remain with a membership status as a basis, it could be the membership basis, and all the other or some of the so other members would have a, a kind of a, a, so a membership prime, depending of what's happening there. But some levels of uh, of membership, uh, I would I would uh, very much like uh, to see. Thank you. Some level of membership, I like uh, the. Uh... <laughs> The deliberate vagueness, perhaps, of the uh... <laughs> Peter. Final words. Thank you, Natasha. You know, by nature, I'm not a realist. I'm a naively optimistic always, uh, and uh, this is something that uh, keeps me uh, keeps me going. You know, and I hope by 2030 um, there will be some countries of uh, Western Balkans already uh, in the European Union uh, and uh, the others on their way. But for this to happen, as I said, first we have to rekindle this ambition, this hope and this uh, geostrategic view of uh, why consolidated Europe is important in order to play an important role in this uh, fastly changing world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists. And uh, I think we can say a good luck to, uh, to Peter and to all your colleagues uh, to implement as much as possible of this ambitious agenda in the, uh, in the six months to come. Thank you.